Hi, I'm Nicholas Ejebeck and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Danish Blockchain Lab. I'm very happy to be here and speak about the topic 7 ways of ensuring security of your blockchain product. At Danish Blockchain Lab we are experts at focusing on security audits, um, mainly focusing on blockchain. We find it uh, very interesting that a lot of companies are choosing blockchain as a technology, specifically because of the security function that it carries. But after they have chosen blockchain, uh, what happens very often is that security in the everyday continuously integration is kind of uh, moving into the background. So we see a lot of these companies have uh, chosen blockchain to prove security, um, but in the everyday they are not really focusing that much on security. And that is uh, some of the points that I will be uh, focusing on in this presentation. So a lot of the reasons for choosing blockchain as a technology, uh, underlying technology, um, is definitely to make sure that uh, the things that you're carrying in the product is uh, being held secure. So what we often hear is, uh, but it's a blockchain, so it's secure, right? And we often uh, meet this misconception that blockchain is carrying uh, some sort of security magic inside it, uh, meaning that once you have chosen blockchain as a technology, then you do not longer uh, have to focus on security. And uh, I will be showing you some numbers, and I bet that a few of these numbers will probably show that this is definitely a misconception within this industry. So just by now in 2022, uh, we know that $2 billion has been uh, stolen by hackers. We know that a lot of this is targeted at DeFi and a lot happened through uh, blockchain bridges. Um, what we also know is that um, it has kind of changed from being single groups and single person individuals who are doing these attacks and switched more into being dominated by very professional groups, um, very professional organizations, uh, and even sometimes nations uh, really focusing on carrying out these attacks very professionally. So these are some numbers from uh, from this year, uh, from some of the largest hacks that happened so far. Um, there may have happened a few more hacks uh, since I created this presentation uh, only a week ago. But uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with a few of the biggest ones. That would be Axie Infinity, Wormhole. Um, and what is really, really interesting when we look at these numbers, uh, besides the amounts of, uh, of money and funds being stolen, um, is that um, not all of them is actually targeted through the smart contracts. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that a lot of the companies that we uh, are in touch with, the first meeting that we have them, with them, the client uh, usually asks us, uh, asks us if we can conduct a smart contract uh, audit for them. And yes, definitely we can. But the thing is that smart contracts is not the only way uh, that hackers can can uh, exploit your blockchain product. Of course, that does not mean that you should not focus on securing your, your smart contracts. You should definitely do that. Um, but it has become very clear that hackers are taking advantages of other uh, ways in into your product as well. So if we go back to uh, the numbers and the model that I just showed, um, what is interesting when we take a closer look here is that uh, in only two of these cases, uh, the hackers actually gain access to the funds directly through the smart contracts. And a lot of the other cases here, the hackers got in in, in different ways. A good example of uh, hacking uh, or getting hacked, not getting through the, uh, the smart contracts as the first touch point is uh, especially Axie Infinity that was carried out by a, uh, a well-known hacking group. Um, what they did was that they actually created this fake job ad company, a fake tech company that uh, posted fake job ads, and they actually directed this to some of the developers, the core developers in Axie Infinity. Um, so what happened was that these uh, uh, engineers at Axie Infinity, they actually started to apply for jobs at this fake company, which was basically set up by the hackers. And eventually, uh, the hackers uh, were very successful providing different files back and forth, uh, which the um, job seekers in, in this scenario uh, falsely thought that was uh, PDFs with uh, uh, material, CVs, resumes, stuff like that. 
and uh, in fact it uh, infected the uh, the uh, the infrastructure and the computers uh, of Axie Infinity, which made the uh, the hackers able to draw out uh, more than six hundred million dollars. So that's a very interesting case where we know that the hackers actually did not get in through the smart contracts, but they got in through uh, regular, uh, almost, if you will, uh, phishing. So if we kind of divide it into different categories here, um, we can see that a lot of the cases um, that I showed you right before um, actually happened through phishing. And uh, if you're not that familiar with phishing, uh, it's a type of like social engineering. Um, and it's often a way that uh, hackers trick themselves into the organization, either by, uh, it could be that they are scamming your domain, it could be that they're creating a domain that is very much looking like uh, your domain. And um, what they will do is that they will be sending fake mails, they will be getting you access codes, uh, they can get you to uh, draw out money and all sorts of stuff like that. Another huge chunk uh, is um, misconfigurations. A lot of the cases we see are happening due to the fact that blockchain is such a new technology, meaning that it is very difficult to gather a large development team that has done this a million times before. So I usually say that this is one of the, uh, the rare businesses, uh, one of the few businesses where you are almost considered a senior after only one year. So what often happens is that if you like to scale up and create a huge team, you will be ending up with one senior and a lot of uh, developers who may be doing this for the first time. And that means that a lot of them will be skipping some corners. They will be copy pasting uh, code from different repositories, which can be totally fine if you know what the repositories contain and what the code actually do. Um, so what the hackers can use here is, of course, they can go through the smart contracts. They could also be accessing master keys. They could be exploiting wrong setups in two-factor authentication, um, or they could be taking over domains. We recently saw a uh, example of this. The hackers were actually hacking uh, GoDaddy, and what happened was that they took over the domain of this company, blockchain web three company, and they changed the DNS so it directed to the hackers' side, and they have made this. Uh, replica of, of the original site, meaning when people, the users were locking in, they were asked to reconnect their wallets. Everyone did, or most of them did. Um, and then the, the hackers were actually able to, to draw out funds from, from the wallets. Another way, uh, of course, as uh, most of you probably know, is the vulnerabilities in the smart contracts, and that will be exploiting blocks of vulnerabilities in the smart contracts. And that's definitely a factor that, that you need to take into consideration as well. Even though that we see a lot of these attacks is actually directed at organizations where the general level of security is, uh, is low. Right, so what do we actually need to take into consideration when we want to increase the security of blockchain products? Let me give you seven points. All right, the first point here is uh, probably better off uh, thinking through before you actually are launching the product. Uh, and it's about tokenomics. And um, a lot of um, people out there are not considering tokenomics being part of like classical security. Um, but the thing is that if it has not been put up right, um, then you will actually uh, be able to find yourself in a position where someone can take advantage of bad uh, structures or bad mathematical structures, or bad uh, economical structures in your environment, meaning that they can actually draw out a lot of funds um, and doing things that they were not uh, supposed to do. And by that, parties can actually come in and draw out uh, and take advantage of, of the bad structures in the setup of the tokenomics. And that can be very mission critical for your product. So we have worked on projects where our experts in tokenomics have saved uh, projects from being misused by bad actors solely due to poor tokenomics. There's also a huge need for looking through the blockchain network uh, security. By that, it's very important to have a focus on the whole network uh, surrounding the blockchain um, because there will be infrastructure, databases, servers, uh, and stuff like that that can be exploited. Um, so as you are considering to focus on smart contracts, you need to have the same focus also on the infrastructure and on your server side as well. All right, a lot of these applications um, that are being used together with the blockchain um, they can contain a lot of vulnerabilities also. So you need to take into consideration how strong is the user authentication and how are the endpoints set up 
um, who has access to what, if it's a permission blockchain, um, where access and use are only open to vetted and known participants. Uh, this may include variable levels of access that could change over time. So you need to think about who has access now and what are the, the uh, scenarios that can come in, uh, into the future. What happens if our, ch if our staff changes? Who can take over? And uh, who has access to what? Where are the keys stored within the applications? Uh, how do we make sure that we are not having a decentralized blockchain, but we have a centralized database of all the private keys? We have seen that also. So there's plenty of room to, uh, to look through uh, within the, the application security itself. Another very interesting part here is to institute real-time analytics. And uh, what does that mean? Well, in fact, it means that you have uh, monitor systems monitoring parts of your infrastructure. Um, it could also be your, your protocol itself and looking for anomalies. Um, a good example of that is the example that I mentioned earlier with, with GoDaddy, uh, where the, uh, the, the company was actually hacked through the domain. Um, we work very close together with uh, different vendors within different monetary systems. We're not a software company, but we do consulting. Um, so we point at, at the best within the industry. Um, within Domain Intelligence, we work together with a uh, very, very cool company called FIO. And what they do is that they can actually monitor your domain um, and for you. And, and what it will do is that you will get notified right away if there is a lookalike domain coming up. Uh, that might be uh, taken advantage of by, uh, by scammers. Other than that, they actually have uh, people that can jump in and, and, and take down the, uh, the uh, scam domains for you. So uh, that's a very, very handy uh, piece of software and service that they provide. Other than that, it's very, very uh, important to, to have general log files, general uh, uh, monitoring of uh, transactions of uh, your server side and of your network in general. So what is really, really important after that you have set up a lot of systems for monitoring is actually to have a plan about who will actually act if something happens. Um, what we see a lot is that, of course, it's very, very well known that if you as an organization do not have any systems to monitoring, then of course your security level is very low. But we also see that if you increase the products within monitoring, uh, then you'll be ending up with a lot of uh, data, a lot of monitoring, and that will actually make your security decrease again. And the reason for that is that your staff uh, is probably not geared to actually figure out who will actually act upon this data. Maybe they also have uh, other things to do than be staring at monitoring services. And uh, that will actually end up uh, drowning your, uh, your staff in, in data and not having a real strategy for what to actually do when this scenario or this scenario happens. So it's very, very important to have a strategy so the company is uh, able to defend at all time. And uh, unfortunately, the hackers are not taking a day off only because you are. So they will be active if, even though it's Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve or uh, when you are on vacation. We are right now developing a service within uh, response teams, uh, meaning that we can provide 24-7 coverage for our companies, uh, making sure that we will take over and defend in the case that uh, an attack is, is happening. Next up is um, to make sure that your audit strategy is actually in place. And by that I mean, why are you doing the audit? Are you doing this only to please your investors, only to please your users? Or are you actually looking into making sure that you have a secure product? Um, so it's very, very important to have a strategy about your audits. What part of your, st your structure and your product are you actually auditing and why are you doing it? Um, a lot of the audits that's being done today are very retrospective, meaning that it will tell a lot about if your product has been un unsecure or secure up until now. And once you have done the fixes, then you will actually probably be outdated within a few weeks meaning that an audit will probably never look into the future. So it's very important to have a strategy uh, sort of, uh, around how often do we do it uh, and why and what parts are we actually doing. Last but not least, um, it's very, very important, of course, only to use trusted auditors. Um, and it's very important to make sure that you are aligned with the auditors and you understand what kind of methods that they use. The worst case scenario is that the audit company will tell you, well, everything is okay, we didn't find anything, but they don't tell you how they, uh, they conducted the audit. 
uh, they did not tell you about what kind of blind spots uh, they may have or they did not tell you about the method meaning um, how and uh, what what areas are they leaving out of this um, because if you do not understand the methods and if you do not understand the blind spot that it may leave you with um, you don't fully understand the uh, the risk afterwards then you could have this as like a false security and that's definitely not good for anyone it's not good for the audit company it's not good for the client to have false security within the space all right thanks a lot thanks for having me it was a great pleasure to do a speech here at hyperledger um, and thanks a lot take care